meantime, in China, uh, Xi Jinping, um, the um, well, premier head of China, is about to get reconfirmed in his position in the next few days, and he will become perhaps one of the most significant leaders of the modern era in China. And China, of course, uh, very busy, very busy and very powerful and very connected to us through trade. So what does that mean for us? What is happening with this China push into the Pacific that was uh, being talked about, what, five, six weeks ago? Where is New Zealand at and how do we chart our relations, um, our relations with well, the other superpower, China. There are two superpowers, it would seem to me, in the world now. There is China and the United States. We've got relationships with both of them, um, but the relationship with China in particular needs to be carefully managed. To talk about all of this, we are joined by Nicholas uh, Koh. And Nicholas is an uh, international relations professor with a focus on Chinese foreign policy at Otago University. Uh, University. Nicholas, welcome to the platform. Lovely to have you with us. Morning, Sean. Great to be here. All right, Nicholas, first up, how significant is Xi Jinping's, um, well, uh, reappointment to head of the Communist Party, to head of China? How significant a figure is he in the history of China? Oh, uh, he will go down as uh, one of the major figures, certainly since 1949. Uh, the significance of this Communist Party Congress that's going to occur is that he is actually going to be confirmed as a leader for the third term as Communist Party leader. And that is significant. No other leader other than Mao Zedong, the original and first leader of the People's Republic of China, has ever served this long uh, in power. So this is a very significant development. It also suggests a number of things, which is that um, there's a significant consolidation of power by C. And we have to ask ourselves, in the 21st century, what does this mean? Uh, the People's Republic of China is basically doing s state planning and industrial policy for the 21st century. Needless to say, this is a significant departure from standard models of how to approach one's political economy. And this, therefore, raises a lot of questions in the sense that this is a massive political social experiment that's going on in China at the moment. Uh, and frankly, we're not particularly clear about how this will work in the long run. And the fact that New Zealand is tied to China as its number one trading partner should give us a little bit of pause. It should cause us to focus on the importance of diversification of our economy. Okay, tell us a bit more about Xi Jinping. Is he there because he's good? Is he there because he's popular? Or is he there because he's powerful and he rules with an iron fist? Well, I'd say he is certainly an extremely competent uh, individual. There's no, no doubt that uh, he wouldn't have got to where he is without that degree of competence. Um, his father was a major Chinese Communist Party official uh, during the Mao era. So he has that pedigree in terms of the Communist Party lineage. And um, he's shown himself to be very astute at consolidating power. So within the Chinese political context, uh, we're dealing with a, f a very formidable individual and definitely is not to be underestimated. All right, and someone who could rule effectively for the term of his natural life if he keeps going the way he is. Frankly, that, that, is, a, uh, that is a correct observation. And he's already broken this concept of uh, a leader not serving more than two uh, consecutive terms within the Chinese Communist Party. So this is the point which a lot of observers have made, which is that there is something new going on here because there was an informal rule among the Chinese Communist Party elite after Mao's uh, leadership that to avoid the types of dislocation and frankly disasters that came during Mao's reign, that there had to be some type of check on the exercise of power within the Chinese political system. Now, with Xi, what's happened is because uh, the term limit uh, has, in effect, been torpedoed, uh, basically a two-term uh, restriction on, on the head of the Chinese Communist Party, uh, because this has been basically removed by, by Xi's third tenure, which is going to start uh, at the party congress this weekend, because of this change, um, we're in uncharted territory, politically speaking. 
Mm. What is his attitude to the rest of, of, of the world? And, and I, look, actually, I just want to go back and say, so in yeah. some ways, when we look at someone who is shoring up a personal uh, power base, there is perhaps some comparison with Putin in, the Soviet, in Russia, in the former Soviet Union? Well, they're certainly similar in the sense of the politics they practice. These two individuals are what would be known in political science as uh, personalist autocracies. Uh, and so they share a similar approach to how one wields power domestically. Uh, and this is, uh, again, something that is quite different from what we've seen over the last uh, 30 plus years in the post-Cold War era, where there was a tendency, uh, often, you know, that didn't really work out in practice totally, but this sense that uh, if you want to actually bring your country into the 21st century, that you want to at least liberalize aspects of the politics of your country. And uh, this is actually not turned out to be the case with Xi. I would note that when he first took power, uh, he was viewed as a relative reformer who was interested in actually economic growth and there was some optimism surrounding his uh, reign but that turned out to be quite the opposite mm. as you mentioned earlier perhaps new zealand thinks needs to think about diversifying in terms of its trade relationship with china do you believe sure. at, and what a third of our trade currently goes there do you believe that under the current circumstances that represents a risk to New Zealand? And if so, what sort of risk? A risk to what? Well, I should preface my comments by, by saying that we don't want to exaggerate uh, the risk in the sense that uh, economic independence is called interdependence for a reason. China has benefited massively from trade with the world uh, we have little evidence that uh, they necessarily want to break this economic interdependence relationship with us. So the issue is not not about just cutting off the relationship. No, the, relation, the issue is about managing the relationship and trying over time to diversify uh, our economy in a way to modernize it, to restructure it in a way that actually makes us uh, more flexible and, and therefore in a better position and, and to be less vulnerable to types of uh, coercion, uh, particularly economic coercion, but more generally political coercion that we've seen in the uh, relationship between China and Australia. Now, if that isn't a wake-up call, I don't really know what would be a wake-up call. Okay. Give us some examples of how the Chinese have sought to, or indeed have, strong-armed uh, Australia in this way. Well, the, the mere fact that they have been under sanctions since 2020, various types of uh, economic and political sanctions uh, is, is clear enough evidence. And the fact that the Chinese have the capability to have an extended period of sanctions on Australia and other states. So, for example, um, you think about Norway, uh, the award of the Nobel Peace Peace Prize uh, about a decade ago resulted in sanctions. Um, this is unprecedented stuff. So this is actually a phenomenon that we're seeing in the international political system in the last decade or so, which is that states are more willing, they're, they're less inclined to uh, you know, not take out their political problems. They're, they're more inclined to actually uh, sanctions on other states that for whatever reason uh, contravene their interests. Given the size of New Zealand, I often wonder, though, Nicholas, why any superpower would bother even giving us the time of day. Surely we're not a, a country that represents a risk to anyone, or to be honest, despite the fact I think domestically we like to pretend we are, we're not really world leaders in anything, in opinion or thought, are we? We're not that important. Well, well we may think that. The uh, fact of the matter is, uh, there's a strategic competition going on between the United States and China, and they are interested in states, however, uh, quote unquote, small they may or may not be. So um, I'd say that we, we should kind of recognize that we have a role in the world. Um, the actions of the United States and, and China in the sense of trying to cultivate good relations with us suggest that uh, we have a role to play, and I definitely encourage um, us to 
take our role in the in the world seriously because uh, the world is getting to become a much more dangerous place, uh, and um, there's a lot of role for strategic thinking uh, in our approach to China and the United States. Yeah, um, you say diversify because of this reliance on China. Um, yeah. Some in simplistic terms might say, "Well, we go to the U.S. and say you got to do more for us." But that's how we diversify. We simply swap one. Yeah. perhaps less palatable um, um, superpower for one that we have traditionally had more in common with? Well, I'd say that uh, it's not a black and white issue. It's, it's a shades of grey issue. So diversification doesn't necessarily mean you somehow turn a switch and it goes from on to off. It's about progressively over time, um, you know, diversifying your trade partners. And it's not necessarily even just a case of U.S.-China. Uh, diversifying would mean expanding our trade with countries all over the world. So, for example, trying to reach some type of um, trade agreement with the Middle East, um, you know, that would be very wise uh, in terms of strategy. Uh, getting a whole range of agreements with other countries that uh, we don't have, that would be really advisable and and that would be the best way to kind of inoculate ourselves against some of these uh, trade tensions that are existing in the world today mm. has china uh tried in recent times to flex the economic power it has over us in regards to our attitude to other issues have we been targeted by the chinese for a little bit of pressure on any issues well, there's always that undercurrent, um, you know, in, in standard diplomatic relations where, um, you know, states kind of gauge their position in respect to, the, to other states. Uh, if you look at New Zealand, it's quite interesting that for all the talk about values, uh, that when it comes to China, we don't seem to be adopting a values approach. Uh, this suggests to me that uh, we are calibrating our position. Uh, we're not afraid to criticize uh, Russia and agree to sanctions on Russia, but somehow we, we never adopt sanctions against China. I'm not saying we necessarily would want to do that. It's certainly something you want to consider very carefully. But that is a clear uh, example in the strategic terms of where rhetoric doesn't match action. Now, again, I want to say that this may be a very prudent and uh, cautious approach in reality, but it's not matched by our rhetoric. So I'd say that we need to really calibrate our rhetoric and be more cautious in kind of talking about values-related issues because it just raises up contradictions. Hmm. Much talk in recent months about China in the Pacific and our part of the world. Sure. Has that, well, and some would have called it a threat, I guess that's a judgment call, or there's all sorts of values implied by using that word. Has yeah. that largely been addressed? Have we shored up against the, the influence of China in Melanesia, Micronesia, the South Pacific? Well, we're beginning to. There's a lot of uh, diplomacy and work going on under, under the, the, the horizon, so to speak. Uh, in the sense of consolidating relations with our friends and partners, uh, both in terms of the, the great powers, for example, the United States, also regional powers like Australia and our uh, Pacific region partners. So there's a lot of work going on in that respect in the diplomatic field. At the same time, um, you know, this happened quite recently, this uh, developing relationship between the Solomons and China. And we have got to give the government time to really respond uh, over time, and that's the best gauge. I'd say in a year from now, uh, we'll have a greater sense of whether we're responding appropriately or whether we need to up our game. Um, so this is, uh, you know, great power politics coming to our region, and, um, you know, this is a new development uh, that we need to kind of rise to the challenge. So we'll be looking for... Um, how the, for example, um, New Zealand Dipl uh, Diplomatic Corps as well as the Defence uh, Ministry is responding to all of this because this, to be sure, is a 
clear issue where we need to respond to. Our national interests are at stake. Uh, and in some respects, we shouldn't be surprised that the Chinese are trying to expand their influence, seek to in, uh, increase their influence in the South Pacific. Um, this is what great powers do. Um, but at the same time, this is a region where we have a deep interest in. It's near us. Uh, and we have a legitimate uh, stake and contribution to make to the region in terms of stability. Yeah. Nicholas, I want to kind of loop back to where we started to Xi Jinping. Um, could you ever see him equivalently doing what Putin has done in Ukraine, or is he a more stable and pragmatic man than that? I would definitely say a more stable and pragmatic uh, person. So, for example, if you look at the Taiwan issue, uh, there's a lot of talk about how uh, Taiwan might be the next Ukraine. I think that is a lot of exaggeration. Uh, the Chinese are playing the long game here. That reflects a strategic approach to, to the Taiwan issue. Uh, and um, that's something we need to keep in mind. Uh, it's always a little dangerous to draw immediate parallels between what's going on in one part of the world and in another. Uh, and, and therefore, we need to exercise a lot of caution in drawing these parallels. Mm. Nicholas, as always, uh, educational, fascinating and informative uh, speaking with you. I thank you so much for your time on the platform uh, this morning. Thank, thank you. you very much. Indeed. Thank you, Sean. That is uh, Nicholas Cho. He is the um, prof a professor of international relations at Otago University and is pointing out that uh, Xi Jinping is going to become the most powerful Chinese leader since the granddaddy of them all, Mao Zedong, um, when he gets uh, reconfirmed as head of the Communist Party and leader, supreme leader in China, uh, I think Sunday, our time.